So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, firstly, thanks to all of you for having come here. And also thanks to uh, the Center for Public Policy for organizing this talk at such a short notice. So this issue of electoral bonds has been there in the news for about a week now. And uh, all of you must be having several questions. So what we will do today is to uh, look at the following questions. And uh, I don't know how to do this because it's going to take much longer than I thought. But if you have questions, please uh, you know, interrupt me if you like. So we are going to go into some basic questions like what are electoral bonds? We find that many people don't know what is an electoral bond. And why did the government actually introduce them? So we'll discuss that. And on paper, the reasons that the government said for introducing the electoral bonds seem to be very good. So in that case, uh, why did the petitioners challenge it? Just for disclosure, uh, the organization I founded called ADR is a lead petitioner against the electoral bonds. So I thought I should just mention that. It's not a completely um, academic or unrelated uh, discussion because uh, I was involved and ADR was very much involved in this petition. So. Why did the petitioners challenge the electoral bond scheme? Then before the scheme was introduced, two of India's uh, biggest constitutional bodies, that is the Election Commission of India and the Reserve Bank of India were asked by the government to give their views on what the proposed electoral bond scheme was. So what did the Election Commission and the RBI say? So that is another thing that we will discuss. And finally, on what grounds did the Supreme Court strike down the electoral bond scheme? This might get a little legal and technical about nuances of the fundamental rights and so on, but we'll see. <laughs> and then what are the specific orders of the Supreme Court? What exactly did the Supreme Court say? Again, the entire Supreme Court judgment is available online in public domain, so anybody can actually read it. Except that it is 232 pages long and it has a whole lot of uh, legal and fundamental rights and constitutional issues, which in the last 20 years I've been forced to read and learn because there's no choice if you do these kind of things. Why is funding of elections important? Because the court has gone into it. Why is regulation of funding important? Why the court, Supreme Court has gone to it. And just for the record, all leading democracies around the world regulate political party funding, campaign funding. The simple reason is that big money can have big influence on elections and can have big influence on government policies and laws. And this is violative of democracy where there is some kind of equality. So all countries around the world have it. We also used to have it. Well, we'll come to what system we have. And what were the sequence of events leading up to the electoral bond scheme? What happened? Why did in 2017 and 18 they introduce this? Because since 1947, we didn't have anything. What was the trigger for doing that? And what was the earlier system? What were the flaws in the earlier system? And were those flaws actually corrected by the electoral bond scheme as the government claimed or it was just a statement? So these are some questions that we want to discuss today. Uh, I tried to cover whatever questions. So, <laughs> you know, in Hindu philosophy, there is a position of a Purva Paksha. Purva Paksha is the one who gives the counter arguments. So in the Supreme Court judgment, uh, the Purva Paksha is the Attorney General of India on behalf of the government of India. And what were the objections? Uh, that he raised. So, would the electoral bonds have removed black money as claimed? The Supreme Court went into this because there is a wide public perception. Then there is this another bogey being raised about donors' right to privacy. That as a donor, 
as an individual, apparently I have a right to privacy. And if I donate less than 20,000 rupees, that information need not be disclosed by the political party to the public. The court has said that in this case, it is because you are genuinely interested in supporting that party. However, the government itself says that if you are giving more than 20,000 rupees, then full details have to be disclosed. Again, Supreme Court said we are not getting into whether 20,000 is the right number. But when large amounts of money are given, then quid pro quo, that is influencing elections, influencing government policies is possible. And therefore, uh, the right to privacy cannot be held over and above uh, the right of the voter to know. Because as a voter, they're trying to balance two things. As a voter, I need to know who is funding whom, by how much. Because uh, the last estimate was that 2019 elections, India spent more money than the United States some six or seven billion dollars with a per capita income of one tenth of the US or something we spent you know that kind of money on elections and when we are spending that kind of money on elections is it influencing election outcomes and as voters do we have a right to know who is giving how much money to whom before we vote so that right has to be balanced with the right of privacy of the donors so the Supreme Court went into that question also and gave some response. So if time permits, we'll go into that. The question is, Supreme Court said, no, you can't have a right to privacy like that. Then there's a whole set of legal questions, which I probably will not have time to. But just for the record, this electoral bill scheme, electoral bond scheme, was legally highly complicated. It amended four laws. It amended the Representation to People Act. It amended the Companies Act. It amended the Income Tax Act. And it amended something very crucial, which is the RBI Act, Reserve Bank. So four acts were amended to introduce the scheme. And the main purpose of the scheme, which they admitted in court, but not in public, is that to maintain secrecy of the donor. That is the main purpose of the electoral bond. As the government attorney general stated in the Supreme Court, it is there in, the, in their petition, it is there in the judgment. So the main purpose was to maintain secrecy of the donor. For that, four laws were amended. Now, there, when you amend a law in India or you change or introduce a law, it has to be passed in two houses, in the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. But they did not want to go through the Rajya Sabha route. So there is a provision in the constitution called the Finance Act under which there is something called a money bill, which is passed during the budget. In that money bill, which need not be passed by the Rajya Sabha, but can only be passed by the Lok Sabha, in that money bill, these four amendments were introduced. So petitioners have gone to the court and said, is this an appropriate instrument or way of introducing these amendments to a money bill? The court has not gone into that question, although it has struck down electoral bond. A seven judge bench of the Supreme Court is going and can be put into a money bill. So this, all these legal questions are there. If time permits, we will go into them. <laughs> so to continue, what are electoral bonds? Many of you know, this is what it is. It was introduced on the 2nd of January. It is called the electoral bond scheme. It is a bond issued in the nature of a promissory note, which is a bank, bearer banking instrument and does not carry the name of the buyer. I think our friends from finance probably understand it better than me, but you know, when you, this is like a promissory note because the government of India promises to pay you. And uh, it is a bearer banking instrument means when I go, I any one of us can go into a bank on the dates on which electoral bonds were open 
and say, I want to buy an electoral bond for 1,000 rupees. So you give 1,000 rupees, fill out some forms, and they will give you an electoral bond. That electoral bond is a piece of paper where your name will not be there. You are the purchaser. The bank will, of course, have some record, some number that, you know, this 1,000 rupee thing of this number was there. So individuals, group of uh, any individuals, group of individuals or organizations can buy electoral bonds. It can only be cashed by an eligible political party. There is some eligible, means you have to have got 1% of the votes. And should have secured, yeah. And political party should cash that bond only through a bank account. So since everything is through the banking account, the government's official position is that this will remove black money. So this is why the electoral bonds were introduced. So this is taken from the Lok Sabha. So when a bill is introduced in the Lok Sabha, the objects of introducing that bill are put up on the website. So I have taken it from the website. This is what the government says. Electoral bonds were introduced to ensure that all donations to a party would be in the balance sheet. In the absence of electoral bonds, donors would have no option but to donate by cash after siphoning off money from their businesses. So this is what the government says. What they say is donors are very much afraid of giving money if their names are disclosed because they would be harassed. Who is harassing them? The court has said. Imagine you buy a bond of 1,000 rupees, that number and who you are, all your details are with the bank. You go and anonymously, anonymously give it to a political party. That political party will encash it. When they encash it, that name and number will be there. They'll have to record it. That means the State Bank of India, which is the sole bank, they will know who bought it and who encashed it. Agreed? There is a provision in the banking law that for whatever purpose, public purpose, lawful purpose, this purpose, that purpose, the government through the finance ministry can get that information. So court went into all these questions. So this is the stated purpose of introducing the electoral bonds. One thing I've learned is that, so if the bonds are so great, it's going to remove black money, it is going to uh, help donors donate bravely, et cetera, et cetera. What were the petitioners saying? So there were three petitioners, by the way. One was the lead petitioner was ADR. There was another NGO called the Common Cause. And the third petitioner was the Communist Party of India. When petitions of a similar nature are filed in the court, the court registrar clubs them together and all the matters are held, are heard together. It doesn't mean that there is any collaboration between the petitioners. So the petitioner said that voters would not know who funded whom. Which is an international best practice in campaign funding that around the world, in all democracies, voters know who is funded whom. This information is important in a democracy. There's just a little bit of constitutional fact. So our constitution has some articles. So Article 32 says that if a fundamental right is violated, then somebody can file a petition for correction of that fundamental right. So we filed this petition under Article 32. That's a provision in the Constitution. And specifically, this Article 19.1a is popularly called the right to information. It's a fundamental right, but a little bit of constitutional stuff here. In the Constitution, it is called freedom of speech and expression. That means we can we are free to talk. According to the Constitution, I can talk like this and hopefully not go to jail. And freedom of speech and expression also includes writing, going to the court, making movies, writing books, talking, whatever. Even holding protests is a form of expression. So that is a freedom of expression. And over the decades, the court has strengthened this right of freedom of expression by saying, that unless you accept information, you cannot express. Suppose you know nothing. How will you express your freedom of expression? 
<laughs> no facts are given to you. You cannot. So it is assumed in the uh, uh, legal literature that right to information is a part of Article 19.1. So we said that this is being violated because voters will not know who is voting for whom. So that was the grounds of the petition. Uh, so technically, it was also challenged the pro this Finance Act 2017 is that money bill. It is called the Finance Act 217. It has two provisions. One provision is to introduce it as a money bill, which does not have to be put in the Rajya Sabha. So we challenged that, and we challenged all the provisions to all these acts: the RBI Act, the RP Act. RP is the Representation of People Act, the Income Tax Act, and the Companies Act. So I leave it to you. So it amended the RBI Act. It amended the RP Act. So RBI Act says only the Reserve Bank of India has the right to issue promissory notes. But they amended the RBI Act to say that scheduled banks designated by the central government will also have the power to issue electoral bonds which are in the nature of promissory note. No country in the world has done that. There is something sacred about the Reserve Bank. I hope so. Saying that political parties need not disclose financial contribution received through electoral bonds. They amended the Income Tax Act to say the same thing, that you need not uh, keep a record. Then they also amended the Companies Act. Now the Companies Act, it went through some phases, but just before the electoral bond, this was the uh, provision that a company firstly has to be in existence for at least three years to make political donations. Number two, it has to be profit making. Number three, only seven and a half, up to seven and a half percent of the profits made can be given to a uh, political party or to any political party or to difference. That is the limit. These limits were removed. The Companies Act was uh, amended so that loss-making companies can give uh, donations so that they can give any amount they want. And it need not have been in existence for three years. You can set up a shell company today start getting money and donate it tomorrow to the political party of your choice. So these laws were amended. So the Reserve Bank of India was officially asked by the government, what is their response to this proposed scheme? So this is exactly what they said. I quoted it word for word. So the Reserve Bank would say said that it would enable multiple non-sovereign entities to issue bearer bond, which is against the RBI's sole authority. It has the potential of becoming currency. If any of you know of any country, every country has a central bank. If you know of any country, the electoral bonds can undermine faith in bank notes issued by the central bond bank if the bonds are issued in sizable quantities. Because it's like alternate currency. Though the identity of person or entity purchasing bearer bond is known by KYC, entities of the intervening person's entities will not be known. So there's a supply chain. Somebody buys, it goes and gives it in some office, and somebody sends it, somebody receives it, somebody else goes and encashes it. So the intervening people, will, we will not know. And he says this would impact the principles of the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, PMLA. So this would impact the so RBI said that this is going against the principles of the PMLA Act. So the RBI said that the current system of demand draft digital payments are good enough. We don't need electoral bonds because that system, by the way, it still exists. And even during the electoral bond regime, you could also donate to check and bearer bond and what of this bearer checks and digital payments were allowed. So that's good enough. There is no need to have an electoral bond. The electoral bonds, the RBI said, would have an adverse impact on public perception about the scheme, also the credibility of India's financial system in general and the central bank in particular. The RBI gave this in writing to the government. 
for the record reserve bank of india is a constitutional authority independent of the government just like the election commission and the supreme court we have certain things which are independent of the government the reserve bank of india the supreme court the election commission the cag comptroller and accountant general these are all constitutional bodies which are independent of the government so they, this is what the rbi said the finance ministry responded by saying that the core purpose of the electoral bond is to keep the identity of the donor secret yeah and then the election commission was also asked so you can read what the election commission said this is a retrograde step you cannot find out if the political party received donations which prohibits the political parties from donations from government companies and foreign sources so political parties are not allowed to get money from any government department from any public sector unit because um, that is against you know basic elements of democracy and you are cannot get it from foreign companies also but because of the secrecy election commission says i cannot check whether they are violating this principle of funding or not we cannot check so it should not be done it says unlimited corporate funding which is removing that 7.5% would increase the use of black money for political funding through shell companies so both the election commission and the reserve bank went on record objecting against the electoral bonds of course the government ignored it and they went ahead and introduced the scheme so then you know when the next question people ask is why is this important what does it matter why is money in elections important i think all of us have a basic gut feel understanding so that is right whatever understanding we have but this is what the supreme court has said the supreme court says that one way in which money influences electoral outcomes is through vote buying i am just quoted it exactly i have not added my words buying of votes the supreme court stated it in in its judgment another way in which money influences electoral outcomes is through incurring electoral expenditure for political campaigns which is legitimate expenditure and campaigns have a measurable influence on voting behavior because of the impact of all this media on voters so a party with more money can do more campaigns and therefore influence parties i mean voters more so the court went on to say that political parties go beyond traditional methods they sponsor religious festivals community fairs organize sports matches literary competitions etc where cash awards are given and these outreach techniques have a lasting impression on the minds of uninformed voters thus enhanced campaign expenditure proportionately increases campaign outreach which influences the voting behavior of voters so that's what the supreme court said uh it is a five judge constitutional bench on february february 15th uh it said that the state bank of india must stop issuing electoral bonds number 2 it said it has to disclose the names of the purchaser for each electoral bond by march 6th the date is also there in the supreme court order it puts down the date as march 6th and the election commission to publish on their website whatever information it receives from the sbi in so you can also see it as a citizen of india you can go to the eci website and see what um, it says it says we shall not disclose except when ordered to do so by a competent authority or the law the election commission to publish this all the four amendments that of the four laws that we talked was struck down by the supreme court as unconstitutional and the relevant portions of the finance act were also struck down so that is what the supreme court did i want to mention a couple of things what were the background leading to this electoral bonds so there has been a push for 8 10 years to increase transparency meanwhile there was another stream which was triggered by the election commission of india where the election commission it's a little technical but there is something called the electoral trust law so anybody can create an electoral trust companies can create group of individuals can create 
and the sole purpose of the electoral trust is to collect money and donate it to political parties which is fine there's nothing wrong with that now of uh, opacity that means lack of transparency uh, where they said that see so much of money is coming into uh, this thing so they'll have to say we got so much money and they'll keep record of who's giving how much but that pool of money the electoral trust can then disburse to a few political parties so it will be difficult for you to trace uh, from individual so it was aggregate kind of information so the election commission introduced a set of rules saying that the electoral trust must ma uh, maintain granular data so that to the extent possible you can trace where is the money coming from and how much is going where although it was not 100% that also a ruling of the election commission was a background to the introduction of the electoral bond scheme so one is that any one of us can give donations to political parties and as individuals there is no cap you can give as much money as you like and you have to give uh, the old scheme was um, up to 20000 rupees need not be disclosed which means technically you can give up to 20000 rupees in cash but uh, beyond that it has to be by check or draft or online or digital payment and some record has to be kept and that has to be made public by the political party when it files its annual report that was one provision second way is that companies can also do the same thing companies can also donate directly to a political party through uh, i suppose companies are not going to give less than 20000 rupees so they can give through check or draft or online payment and that will also be recorded and made public another provision which was introduced later was the electoral trust scheme not the electoral bond scheme so in the electoral trust scheme is what i just said you know uh, so that is there so that was the earlier scheme see the issue is not that uh, people are that political parties should not receive money. Political parties need money. We cannot pretend that they don't need money. The issue is transparency. So the fact that they received money is not illegal. But now they are making it transparent, that's all. So uh, cash donations up to 2000 can remain anonymous, but be beyond 2000 it has to be made public now when they've struck down that scheme whether that provision still exists or not somebody will have to seek a clarification from the court i don't know uh, between 75 and 90 lakhs per candidate per lok sabha constituency depending on the number of voters and between 25 and 40 lakhs per assembly constituency so there is spending limit per candidate but there is no spending limit on the political party that is how the law is and the if the political party can, will designate 40 star campaigners if they come and campaign and money is spent in that ca candidates constituency by the star campaigners then that 75 lakh limit will not be counted there you can spend 75 crores and say it was spent by star campaigners constituency so all these loopholes are there so one thing that most of us don't know in this country I discovered is that our constitution says that fundamental rights cannot be overturned by law. That's an established aspect of our legal system that parliament cannot pass a law which violates our fundamental rights. Just for the record, such provisions exist in all democracies around the world. Recently, in Israel, they wanted to pass a law saying that judicial review on laws passed by their parliament should not be allowed. I think about half of Israel came on the streets to protest against, including those who voted for that government. We are not democratic enough. You think, what are we doing? So, the Article 19.1a guarantees that all citizens have the right of freedom of expression, which I mentioned. And this has come to mean right to information as without accepting information, you cannot express. So the Supreme Court said that this Article 19.1a is violated in simple terms because we don't know who is 
voting for whom, who is funding whom, how much. So that fundamental right is violated. That is one of the grounds of setting aside the electoral bond scheme. The other one is the Article 14, which is exactly, I just, the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the laws within the territory of India. So equality before law. So, uh, you know, when the Companies Act limit was removed, the court argued in the following way, whether you agree or not, the Supreme Court said that if a company can give unlimited money to a political party, then it is not a level playing field. That equality principle is being violated because somebody else may not be able to give that kind of money. And that company would have undue influence on the government. And therefore, Article 14 is violated. And therefore, we are striking down that Companies Act. So that was the basic fundamental rights on which they and electoral bonds give scope to the ruling party to gather information on donors from SBI, but not to other parties. This also violates Article 14. See, the constitution is a sacred instrument we have in our country. It cannot be the play tool of a group of people who want to use that constitution for some other purpose than for the interests of the nation and the people. So who is going to protect? Uh, we have to protect ourselves. I don't see any other way out other way except we ourselves. So this is what the RBI Act says. I think this is important because we need to know, see the Reserve Bank of India or the Central Bank of any country is, I would almost call it sacred because it is the regulatory bank of the country. It has to maintain the financial health of the banking system, foreign exchange, so many things. It, I mean, there is nothing else than that. And therefore, in the constitution, the Reserve Bank is made constitutionally independent of the government because no political considerations should come into play when the Reserve Bank is acting. Because, you know, it, what decisions they take affects the health of the financial system of the country, the banking system of the country, etc. So this is what the RBI Act says, Section 31. Only the RBI or the central government authorized by the RBI, that is, even the central government has to be authorized by the RBI, shall draw, accept, make, or issue any bill of exchange or promissory note for payment of money to the bearer of the note or bond. Basically, currency. Uh, the RB... <laughs> so what was the amendment? It said that it permits the central government to authorize a scheduled bank to issue such notes. So this section 182 of the Companies Act enables a company to contribute any amount directly or indirectly to any political party. It bars a government company and a company which has been in existence for less than three years from contributing. And average amount should be less than seven and a half. This is the existing scheme which you are asking for. Uh, so this was done to reduce undue influence in elections. There's a history of it. Up to uh, the 70s or something, I don't remember the exact date. Actually, uh, companies were barred from uh, funding political parties. Then they said that they can give up to some 3%, 5%, and the latest before this was 7.5%. And all the time, the purpose was undue influence on government and elections and this kind of a thing. So what did the amendment do? Electoral bonds, it removed that cap. So it said only disclosure of total amount and not amount contributed to each political party and you can donate as much as you like. So as I said, they're 100% tax uh, exempt, both for the donor and the recipient, and they made the following amendment. Political party is not required to maintain records of electoral bonds, and donation limit was reduced from 20,000 to 2,000 for accepting a check, bank draft, etc. Actually, this last pro provision of reducing the limit, according to me, is a good provision. There's nothing, you can't argue, this is perfectly okay. Then the Representation of People Act was also amended. You see, <laughs> since 1951, it was never amended. It was amended once when the VA, same, we in ADR went to the Supreme Court for disclosure of candidate criminal records. 
they amended the RPI Act, uh, RP Act. We challenged it. It was struck down as unconstitutional. This is the second time they are doing it since 1947. 